seats. And as you do, please turn to Ecclesiastes in chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We'll read together the first three verses of the chapter. Ecclesiastes 4. The Bible reads, Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressors was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead, who are already dead, more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. This is the word of the Lord. We continue looking at our study of life under the sun from this book. And the passage before us this morning is one that describes the grim condition of the world. And our passage has no answers or solutions It just presents the problem as it is. And the problem highlighted in the passage is that of oppression. And so that's what we'll look at this morning, the reality of oppression. The mere description of the problem in the text, as I've been saying, when Ecclesiastes presents to us all these things which are wrong with our world, the mere mention and presentation of the problems in our world must be a source of uh, comfort to us because it's, God, it's, it's, it's really God acknowledging that the brokenness that we see, the problems that we see, are uh, things that he himself sees. Because this is his word. And so as we read about the grim reality of oppression in the world, this, this is God's word. This is God acknowledging that there's something wrong here. And there's a problem. And he sees it. He's not indifferent to it. In fact, God is on record for having a heart for the oppressed. He put it in the Israelite code or law in in Exodus chapter 22 verse 21 when he says you you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him. Sojourner is someone who is traveling through your town or city or country. You shall not wrong a traveler or sojourner or oppress him. For you were sojourners or travelers in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. And here is what God says. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn. And I will kill you with the sword. And listen to this. And your wives shall become widows and your children shall become fatherless. If you mistreat these people in your society, the aliens traveling through your land who do not call your land home, the widow and the fatherless, I will turn those you love into sojourners and widows and uh, orphans. 
verse 25 says if you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor you shall not be like a money lender to him and you shall not exact interest from him if ever you take your neighbor's cloak in pledge you shall return it to him before the sun goes down for that is his only covering and it is his cloak for his body in what else shall he sleep and if he cries to me i will hear for i am compassionate so we see it uh, outrightly explicitly that God is not indifferent to the oppressed. What we are reading of in Ecclesiastes is not a new idea that God is concerned about oppression. It's there from the beginning of his very word in Exodus. Listen to James 5, James chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. He's concerned about those who are oppressed, those who are shortchanged for their work. So let's look at the reality of oppression this morning. And let's begin by defining what oppression is. It's amazing how we miss understand in our world uh, what oppression is and who is oppressed. In Europe and in the U.S., in America, the word oppression is a trigger word. And uh, they have really defined it in this way or, or, or accepted this definition of one who is oppressed. Their view is that many, uh, though, their view is that those who are born with natural privilege, they didn't choose to be privileged, they didn't make a decision to be, they're just born uh, with wealth or born white because most whites enjoy privileges, uh, are oppressors just because they are oppressors, even before they've done anything. They are already guilty of oppression. And those who are born naturally in disadvantage, in poverty, and uh, you know, all these things, are by nature oppressed. And even though the one with privilege has never even met the one without privilege, there, there is already oppression happening. And so the oppressor is guilty before he opens his mouth or even does anything. Just by virtue of their privilege, they are oppressed. That's not biblical oppression. That's not what the Bible teaches us. That just results in a culture of guilt and victimhood, where there is no victim and there is no real guilt. But we have our own misconceptions about oppression in Africa. Not so far from what I've just described in Europe and America. There are those of us who think that just because I was born in poverty, by virtue of the fact that I was born in a village or in some compound or rural area without electricity, without all three meals, sharing a room with five to six people, ETC, just because of those hardships, I am oppressed. So no one did anything to you to force you to be in that situation. In fact, it's God who put you in that situation. He, he organized and planned that you should be born in poverty. 
born to uneducated parents who don't have any money, uh, and you say, well, just by virtue of my background and the hardship I have faced, I am oppressed. That's not oppression. That's providence. A difficult and challenging background in life is not oppression. Another misconception we have is that the government oppresses us by virtue of the fact that they don't take good care of us. To put it differently, we feel oppressed when the government doesn't give us handouts. If there are no government bursaries to take me to college or university, if education is not free, we feel oppressed. If there is load shedding, we feel oppressed. Amen? That's not oppression. I've said a number of times, the government is not your mother. Have you heard me say that here before? Government is not your mother. I remember telling a pastor friend in the U.S. that, you know, back home, people call the president daddy. And he said, oh, you know, it was repulsive. And he said, what? And, and obviously, it, it, what it brings is this uh, idea that, um, again, victimhood. I, I'm oppressed. The government is not doing what? They are not taking care of me. The government has no interest or capacity uh, to take care of you. But that's our mindset. The government should educate me, give me a job, give me water and electricity, fix the pothole in the street outside my gate. And uh, we think we are oppressed because the government is not doing all these things. That's not oppression. And what these wrong views do is that they take away from the help and sympathy that the truly oppressed should get. Because if we are all oppressed, then there's no one who's really oppressed. When we are pitying ourselves, then there is no one to, who, who, the people who deserve the real pity don't get it. One more misconception, uh, one, one more misconception about oppression is uh, failure. I've seen it in the failure of parents to spank their children. One of the reasons we struggle with spanking our children is we think it is oppressive. It is cruel. It is, uh, it is, to spank your child is to mistreat your child. And so we'd rather not spank the child. And then do you know what that leads to? It leads to real oppression. Because what happens, you tell the child once, uh, sit down and keep quiet. And the child uh, either doesn't do it or obeys for five seconds and they're back. And again, you say, sit down and keep quiet. They sit down and keep quiet. And your blood pressure is what? It's now rising. And the, the volume is beginning to get a little higher. I, I said, sit down and keep quiet. And before long, you unleash hellfire. And the child just gets a slap, doesn't see where it's coming from. And, uh, you know, and now what, what you become cruel to your child. You begin to mistreat your child. Children even have the, the saying, my mother will shout at me. My daddy will beat the, you know, the life out of me. And uh, in a bid, because we are failing to follow what the Bible says about proactive, you know, when you tell a child once that they don't listen, you spank them. But because we are lazy... And we have this misunderstanding of what ill treatment is and oppression is. We don't do what we're supposed to do and we end up oppressing our children. So you see so many wrong views about oppression, but what is the right view? What, what is oppression? Here's a definition. Oppression is the mistreatment, abuse, and cruelty of those with superior power and authority upon those weaker and subject to them. Mouthful. Let me 
go through it again. Oppression is synonyms, mistreatment, abuse, cruelty, pick your term, or pick all, through, all three, by those with superior power and authority upon those weaker and subject to them. That's oppression. It's to take advantage of one's power and authority to ill-treat and mistreat and be cruel and even manipulate and abuse those who are subject to you or weaker than you. That's oppression. Let's see the reality of oppression in this world from this passage, Ecclesiastes 4. Three things about the reality of oppression. First, oppression is pervasive. Ecclesiastes 4.1. The first part, again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. He saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. He, he took time to observe and to, to analyze the oppressions that happen in our world. And if you took it upon yourself to do the same with right definitions, what would you find? This observation by Solomon was undertaken thousands of years ago. But I bet your findings will not differ much from what he found. Oppression is as real today as it was then. Those superior in power and authority abusing and ill treating those who are weak and subject to them. As long as there is someone in authority, it's almost a given that they will be abusive in some way. They will, they will eat, you treat and take advantage and manipulate those who are subject and weaker than them. To put it differently, there are very few people who have power and authority over others who don't oppress them. There's oppression in homes. We've already, already hinted at that with regard to how parents who actually love their children end up being abusive to them. The, most of, uh, actually, you know the one who will do the most damage to your children. We're always worried about damage from the outside. It, it's, it's us. Because we'll pass on our bad habits and our ill tempers and will be, you know, instead of doing what the Bible says we should do, we go our own route and we end up destroying our own children. But this whole thing of screaming in anger and uh, uh, ill-treating children, it's the parents who are most guilty of that. And uh, I see it even in myself at times. Mistreating a child who is weaker than you, who is subject to you. Husbands oppress their wives by being harsh, insulting them, and even beating them. There's oppression in churches. This tends to come in the form of uh, manipulation. Many so-called men of God using the scriptures to manipulate and abuse people. In 2 Timothy 3 verse 6, what we see today in many churches was predicted where the man of God sleeps with multiple women in his church. He's in a place of power, he's in a place of authority, and they respect him, they listen to him, and he's able to do whatever he wants with them and serve his own personal interests and take advantage of them. That's oppression. In 2 Timothy 3 verse 6, it says, For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women. Did you know that was in the Bible? Burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. So many men of God 
take advantage of the women in their churches and the people in their churches. There's oppression in the workplace. Companies employ fewer and fewer people to do more and more work. And the hours that you've been given in your contract are not enough to accomplish the work that is put on your table. They're not. But they keep piling the work on the people and the people have to work long hours to meet their targets and their lives are thrown into shambles, upside down. They don't have a life because uh, they are being taken advantage of. People are underpaid. And I don't just mean the former workplace, I mean even the informal workplace, that we are guilty of this. That uh, we underpay the gardeners and the maids. We don't pay them on time. We are rude and abusive towards them. We, we take advantage of them. There's oppression in schools. And I'm not even thinking about teachers and school administration abusing pupils and students. I'm talking about children abusing each other. You'd think that if we brought innocent little children together, there would be no oppression. And they'll just, you know, get along. Nothing could be further from the truth. You find bullies amongst children in schools. And because a child is bigger and smarter on the mouth and has more popularity and has more beauty, they begin to be abusive and to mistreat other children. Leave small children, even babies, toddlers, to play together for some minutes. Uh, and every 10 minutes, what are you going to hear? You go there, what's the problem, what's the problem? And you have to separate them. Hey, give your friend. Don't hit your friend. And you go. After 10 minutes, ah! what's going on? Oppression. Amongst uh, kids who should be clueless. You go into schools and you find the bigger children in size bullying the smaller children. And if you have a child who is big, most likely they bully. Just go and do some research. And you discover they're actually bullying. That sweet child of yours, who looks so innocent, is busy bullying other children. Oppression is pervasive. And what stood out for him was the tears of the oppressed. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 1. Again I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold... The tears of the oppressed. That's what stood out for them. All these people crying, weeping, as a result of all the oppression that they are subjected to. Second thing is uh, oppressors are powerful. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 1 again. Again I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. The power was on the side of the oppressors. They would not be able to oppress if they did not have that power. And we need to bear in mind who's speaking. This is Solomon, a man who was king over his kingdom, given a wealth of wisdom, wealth of resources, and is sitting there helplessly watching all the oppression. Solomon, the great king, who had this massive empire endowed with wisdom by God, if anybody could uh, end oppression, surely it would be him. But he is a king who is running his kingdom and who we assume has power to quash and deal with oppression in his kingdom. But he's complaining like all the rest of us. 
Look at all the oppression. Look at everything that is happening. With all his power, he did not have the ability to end decisively oppression. And all he could do was sit helplessly like the rest of us and watch people get oppressed. Can we end oppression? Is it possible to, to be done with oppression in this world and form a oppression-free utopia? It's not possible. You start a company and you put people there. And as a Christian, you want to run it on Christian values, your verses and all these things. And just send someone to do an audit after two, three years. And to hear what is really happening on the ground. You find there's oppression there. And uh, you are powerless to end it. The mere number of oppressors and power that they have stops us and prevents us from putting an end, decisive end to this. One of the benefits that we thought would have uh, by a rich man such as Hakainde Hichilema coming into power was that finally, we, if there's a rich man, he, he won't steal from us, isn't it? Since he's already rich, he already has money. So for some of us, we're thinking, yeah, maybe if we have a rich man, the corruption and the oppression and all these things that happen and the, uh, will subside, will be done away with. But uh, with all of his good intentions, has he managed to deal with corruption? He's still chasing people around. Even if you ascended to the greatest seat in the entire world, General Secretary, Secretary of the UN, uh, President of the United States, you would not be able to get rid of oppression. That's the power of the oppressor. You cannot be everywhere, and so you cannot remove all oppression. And as long as there are people relating with one another, all you need is a power dynamic. All you need is one having authority over the other, and it is a magnet for oppression. And I think this is what Solomon realized. Have you, have you, you, you can't stop this animal. And that expla explains why he doesn't talk about stopping oppression. There's nothing in this verse. So we must stop oppression. No, where does he go? We must comfort the oppressed. That's where he goes. He says it twice. And even there, there was a gap. There was no one to comfort the oppressed. Those who are not being oppressed are either doing the oppressing, and if they're not doing the oppressing, they are nowhere to be seen in terms of comforting those who are oppressed. The power of oppression is such that you can't rid the world of oppressors. Even the one who was previously oppressed as soon as they have power in their hands, they start oppressing others. They learn nothing, it seems, from the abuse and the treatment that they receive. It just goes off from their mind as soon as power comes in their hands and they're oppressing others. It's just a, a cycle that never ends. They forget that they just endured oppression themselves and quickly oppress others. They forget the mercy they have been shown. Even if you, you said in, in this whole generation, God, maybe let's try this. Let no one be oppressed. So that when the next generation comes, we are not passing on oppression. It won't work. In Matthew 18, verse 23 to 34, we've got this parable Jesus told about this uh, terrible, wicked, unforgiving servant. Matthew 18, 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven will be compared, may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. 
When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, same thing, and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will repay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the His fellow servants saw what had taken place. They were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Is there anything wrong with uh, him pursuing what was owed to him? Yes, in light of what the mercy he had been shown. And that's why the, the servants were observing said, no, there's, there's a problem, there's disparity here. This is oppression here. He has just been shown mercy and yet he behaves in this way. And look at how he behaves. Verse 28, he seized him and began to choke him. That's not how he had been treated. Well, that's the power of the oppressors. Anyone, even those who have come from a background of zero oppression, become oppressors. Even from a background of those who have been shown mercy and grace and love and kindness, become oppressors. And so you can't put an end to it. The power is with the oppressors. Thirdly and finally, oppression can result in despair. Verse 2 and verse 3, Ecclesiastes 4. And I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. When you see how pervasive oppression is, when you see the insurmountable power of the oppressors, it can lead you to despair. When you experience oppression, it can lead you to despair. When you see that you are subject to someone and you have no ability to escape them or defend yourself from them, all that is left is for you to endure the suffering in tears, as Solomon describes. I saw the tears of the oppressed. It can lead you to despair. Solomon, upon seeing all the oppressions and the power of the oppressors, concluded that those who were dead were better off than those who were still living. Better to be dead, he says. Better to not be alive and see or endure the evils that are done under the sun, the oppressions that go on. And he goes further. 
So it's better even to not be born at all. If you are living, you are better off dead. And if you never get born, you are the best of all. You will not go through this gut-wrenching experience of seeing or feeling the harsh reality of oppression. In his own words, seeing the evil deeds that are done under the sun. We all wish we could continue viewing the world as innocently as uh, we did as children when life was nice and sweet. We wish we did not from realizing the kind of evils that go on under the sun. So that's what Solomon gives us. No answers, no solutions, just this grim reality. Oppression. It's pervasive. The oppressors are powerful and it can lead us to despair. So what do we do with this? A couple of things. First, we need to understand that while we cannot end and eliminate oppression completely. We can do something uh, about, we can fight for justice. And God says that in his word, fight for the justice of those who are oppressed. There's certainly room for that. But what we cannot do is eliminate and completely remove oppression. It's not in our power. Let me remind you again of what he uh, he, he, he says that we should comfort the oppressed. But even before we get there, this is what I've been trying to hint at, is that we often view oppression as a problem out there. We don't realize that oppression is a problem in my heart. I am oppressive by nature. From the time I was in diapers, I was grabbing toys from babies, because I was bigger and stronger than them. And that has not changed to this day. We must examine ourselves to ensure we are not contributing to this cancer and this scourge upon the world that God has created. We can examine our lives to see if we are involved in oppressing others, in using our power and authority to ill-treat and be cruel to those who are subject to us and weaker than us. What is your relationship with those who are under your authority? Those whom you are more powerful than? Do you use your power and authority to abuse and ill-treat them? Do you manipulate them? Do you raise your voice at them? Do you make them feel your power and your authority? That's the mindset. Eh? People must feel my presence here. Do you shame them and embarrass them? That's oppression. What is your relationship with your wife? What is your relationship with your children? What's your relationship with your gardener and with your maid? I'll never forget our study in Ruth. When Boaz arrived at the field, where Ruth was working in his field, and his servants greeted him with a blessing. The Lord bless you. And I tried to make a point from there. Is this, what, is this true of us? Can those who are weaker than us and under our authority say, God bless this man. God bless this woman. Because instead of using their power and their authority to do what everybody else is doing, they use their power and authority to be a blessing. To, to love and care for me. How do you treat the employees at your company? How sad it is in Christian companies to see that uh, they, they, they make the employees be the first to suffer when money is not coming in. All the while, their kids are still going to the same schools and 
still eating the same foods and life is going on as it is. And then they tell the employees there's no money and I'll sort you out when uh, money comes while keeping them working. At least the honorable thing to do is look for money to sort them out for the work they have done, even cut it mid-month and say, money is not flowing, I've just gotten a loan to sort you guys out, go home, I'll call you when the money starts flowing. No. What do they do? They keep them working. And people in Christian companies go months. Run by Christians, reformed. And they go months without pay. That's oppression. Problem is not out there. The problem is in our hearts. How do you treat those in your department? Maybe you're not an employer, but you have some people under you. People you are responsible for. People who answer to you. How do you treat them? We need to see the problem of oppression ultimately is not out there. It is in our hearts. Our sinful nature with which we are born leads us to oppress others. We are selfish by nature. Life is about me and my enjoyment. And me exerting force and my power and strength on others. And when the opportunity presents itself for me to throw my weight around, I won't be slow in making people see that I'm in charge here. That's how we're born. That's how we come into this world. So instead of us trying to change the world, how about we examine ourselves? Instead of us looking out there and become justice warriors, how about bringing justice to my home? Bring justice to my business. And not abusing and mistreating those who are under me. We are all oppressors. What we lack is opportunity. That's it. One of the things I found utterly shocking is to see the cycle of abuse from mothers-in-law to daughters-in-law. And you meet uh, a woman and she will tell you the horror stories of how her mother-in-law ill-treated her. How she, her mother-in-law made us feel small and inadequate and unworthy and unfit to be the wife of their son and was critical of the cooking and how he kept the home and everything and just burdened and loaded and made life miserable. And the son obviously is caught between a rock and a hard place, right? He's trying to tone down his mother. He's trying to uplift his wife. But the balancing act is not really working out. Critical, abusive mothers-in-law. And yet the shocking thing to me is that when these women now get a daughter-in-law, the cycle doesn't end. Do the exact same thing. It doesn't click to say I was crying Wetting my pillow with tears at night because of how my mother-in-law treated. It doesn't click to say, can I try and do better with my daughter-in-law? It's, it's insanity when you think about it. How that we can complain about being ill-treated and go out and just ill-treat others. The problem is not out there. The problem is in our hearts. So we need to repent. We started by seeing God's heart for the oppressed. The judgment he pronounces on those who ill-treat and are cruel and abuse those who are weaker than them and under them. We have to repent. We have to say, Lord, forgive me. And even go to those who have ill-treated. And say, I've not acted correctly. I've not used my power in a way that pleases and honors the Lord. By God's grace, I hope to treat you better. So that's the first takeaway from this passage. Are you oppressive to those under you? 
And let's not play down our sins and make the sins of others bigger. We must make sure we aren't oppressors ourselves. Secondly, we must comfort the oppressed. I, I hinted at that. I said that uh, that's where Solomon goes. He doesn't say, come on, let's form a movement to end oppression. His cry is that there is nobody to comfort those who are oppressed. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Down to verse 7. Second Corinthians 1. Sad thing for Solomon was there was no one to comfort the oppressed. If you want a world free of oppression, go to heaven. What really got him was that there was no one to comfort the oppressed. Not to end the oppression, but to comfort the oppressed. There were no people with a heart for the oppressed. There were no people to sympathize and comfort the oppressed. There was no one to encourage them and keep them from the despair we read about in verse 2 and verse 3 of Ecclesiastes 4. It's interesting that the scriptures tell us that God allows us to go through certain challenges for the sole purpose that we can comfort those who go through the same thing. First, Second Corinthians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our affliction for what purpose? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and your salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort. This is something we need to be aware of. That life is not just about us, me, myself, and I. And as soon as I get into challenges and problems, I am preoccupied only with getting out. So that the only thing I want is a free-flowing, free-selling, comfortable, pain-free life. No, God will bring and allow challenges. So that when we look to him and get comfort, we can be Christ to others. We can comfort others. God allows us to go through some of these things so that we can comfort others. In James 1.27 it says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is a call to comfort the oppressed, and not to turn a blind eye. And for some of us, we're even able, as Paul is saying, to speak from experience. Or oh, you've lost a loved one. I've been there. Or oh, you are sick with this illness. I've been there. Or oh, the bosses at work are driving you nuts, and you're on the verge of giving up. I've been there. You're not getting justice over this issue. You've been shortchanged. I have been there. Let me walk with you. Let me comfort you. Let me pray with you. Finally, in line with this, we see God's intervention for the oppressed. Uh, it's not to end all oppression. I hope we know God can snap his fingers and all oppression can be gone. That's not outside his control. But I think he did something even better. He stepped into this oppressed world and comforted us. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, He, Jesus Christ, was oppressed. 
and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, led like a lamb, uh, uh, sorry, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, he, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. When he died on that cross, it was oppressive. He died as an innocent man who did not deserve what he went through. And the message of Isaiah 53 is that he was stricken, verse 8, for the transgression of my people. What a God who doesn't just say, let's get rid of all the oppression. He says, Jesus, my son, go step into the oppression. Go and get oppressed. Go and get ill-treated. Go and get beaten unfairly though you are innocent and do it to save my people from their sins. And so how does God intervene? By dealing with the source of the problem. By dealing with this heart that is steeped in sin and is always moving towards oppressing others, dealing with the presence of sin and not just the penalty of sin, dying on that cross, taking the punishment that we deserved through oppression. That's the God who says, repent and believe in me. And when we do that, when we repent of our sins, trust in Jesus Christ, we are not just saved from the punishment that is coming because that's placed on him. He deals with this hard heart, this oppressive heart and changes us and begins to change this world one heart at a time. I pray our hearts would be changed by looking to the one was oppressed for us. Let's pray. Oh Father in heaven, what a wonderful God you are. A God who sends his son down to do the dirty work right here in this broken world. And what a what an indication of your love and in your own words in, Ex in Exodus 22 of your compassion that even though you could have snapped a finger and all this would be gone, you sent your son to deal with the root problem. Show us in our heart of hearts that the problem is with us and it is not out there. That unless we come to you and plead for you to save us and change us through your son, we will not and we cannot change. But it's only by grace, through what your son has done to save us, through the oppression that he went through and judgment that he suffered, on that cross to save us from our sin that we can be changed that we can use the power and the authority that we have over others to bless them rather than to mistreat them and take advantage of them do these things we ask in Jesus name Amen let's sing together number 100